Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to the March edition of Molten Music Monthly. Well, the clocks have just gone forward and I'm really starting to feel that hour already as time pulls us inexorably towards Superbooth in May with perhaps a little bit of a stop off in Nam in April. Things are starting to flower, things are blossoming. Products and gear and bits and pieces are popping up all over the place and so who knows what is going to be coming at us in the future. What does all that mean? Oh, I have no idea. Let's get on with this month's awesomeness. Radio then. Telmetronics makes music with fluorescent tubes. Now, I'm sure I was supposed to speak about these last month, but I forgot to, so I'm speaking about that now. Behringer has a tsunami of synths poised. Poised they are to roll over us. Clevgard twinkles with marbles. Midify Loop A gets a song mode. Patching Panda pumps out particles. Soma Labs get pulsy with Andrew Huang. Winterbloom has an epic sequel. Flight of Harmony are birthing aliens. Noise Engineering has a versio that I might actually understand. This is not rocket science pulls drums out of a wobbler. Let's all join the chompy club. Logue does posh MIDI control. Cosmos has a melodic quencer. Cherry Audio takes on the Jupiter 6. Relic is the everything, everywhere, all at once controller. Expert Sleepers design an envelope just for me. G-Force make a monster out of a mini Moog. IntelliJail has a flurry of utilities. And Korg comes up with an Odyssey kit. But first, Synthese. Of course, I must I must speak of Synthese. I feel like I've spoken about kind of nothing else, really, for a long time. But we had it. It feels like forever ago, but it was just a few weeks. Just a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks ago it was, we had this show, Synthese, it was called. It's what we called it. Happened in Norwich, 4th of March. It was a spectacular and awesome, wonderful day. I'm not going to say too much about it because I have this awesome video that you can go and watch which tells you everything you need to know and a live stream debrief I did all about it too so there's plenty of information out there about how well it went but suffice to say it was awesome it was an amazing day Th totally totally thrilling <laughs> I mean how thrilling can synthesizers get really I mean at the end of it but it was it was great the manufacturers seemed to enjoy themselves the people who came seemed to enjoy themselves we enjoyed ourselves performing and milling about and having conversations and generally getting our getting our synth nerds on now it was it was great it could not have gone better well perhaps i could have i could have performed better i could have been more risky i feel I could have put myself out there just that little bit more during my performances, but you know, it went well. And I think everyone was pleased and I think everyone will be back again next year. So that's very exciting. So yeah, if you're interested in what that was all about, go and check out uh, the videos that I've made all about it and, you know, save the date for next year. Right, I meant to mention this last month, completely forgot for some reason, but it doesn't seem to matter because they've achieved their Kickstarter goal anyway. So I don't think I could have actually been in of any of any help. What's it all about? Well, this is the Groove Synth, I think, by Telmetronics. It is, you take a fluorescent tube, right? The sort of thing you have up in your kitchen. You stuff it into a synthesizer and then you somehow extract oscillations and sound from that. That's the idea. It's like contained lightning within a tube that you're you're trying to make sense out of. You're trying to find find a waveform or, or something with which you can extract and shape and use that to create sound and music. It's kind of exciting. The groove tube is what they're calling it. It's I mean it looks stunning. So you've got this this fluorescent tube being all fluorescent and lighting and stuff and you've got all these valves sitting around it you've got controls trying to pull things in take things out they kind of threw itself on kickstarter in order to attract people who would want to get interested in the prototyping and checking it out and working it out and working with them to produce some kind of product down the line because they believe that they have something of an idea there's an idea in there somewhere that's going to produce or going to result in the awesome production of some kind of sound some kind of controllable, manipulable, wave shapeable sound. And so that's the plan. I mean, it looks a bit like a synth. It's got dials and sliders and knobs and bits and pieces on it. But ultimately, it's an experiment that they're just seeing where it goes. So hopefully after hitting their Kickstarter target, it means that they can get on with the 
the, the process of boiling it down to something approaching a product. So that's definitely one to watch. Sorry that I couldn't help out with the Kickstarter last month, but hey, you got there anyway, so well done. Looking forward to hearing more about it. A lot of Behringer action about at the moment on the old socials. They are Facebooking themselves all over the place. Every five minutes you get another sort of green anti-static match with another prototype synth on it with them going, hey, hey, would you like this? Would you like this? This like harks back to those old days when we used to believe everything that they said. <laughs> And when we saw something on a bench of that nature, you'd go, wow, wow, that's going to be around in a minute. That'd be awesome. Let's have a play on that. It doesn't really work. We're not so convinced anymore. I mean, they've obviously suffered very hard during the chip shortage over the pandemic. And that has, that has hit them. And it's hit them in both their, their physical product, but also their sort of philosophy. And the whole ideology behind Behringer is they've, they've been very hot on supplying a product and they haven't been able to. And it's come to the point where we all just go, oh, well, you know, until there's actually something in the shops, it's really hard to get excited about it. So otherwise we'll be on this perpetual level of excitement, supposedly. <laughs> if you like cheap synths, you know. But recently the, the wheels have started churning through on the Behringer marking machine and a lot of that has sort of come to the point where they've suddenly uh, slashed a whole lot of money off all their prices, which is interesting. I mean, you can suddenly get something like the Wasp or the Cat uh, for, for less than ever, like 150 quid these days at Crave prices, which is kind of crazy. Uh, the, the most they've taken off, taken up 60% off the big modular systems, the sort of complete system 15, 35 and 55, I think it was, the Moog modular clones. They've really slashed the prices on those, which, which is interesting, but, but somehow, somehow I predicted this. Somehow I don't feel that it's that surprising because I mean, when that all first came out, I thought it was an interesting choice of thing to clone, but I wasn't convinced that it really added anything to the Eurac community because you kind of have to buy the whole thing. If you're buying into a Moog modular, you buy a Moog modular. If you're buying into a clone, which is Eurac compatible, but still has all the foibles and weirdness of the original Moog, then you kind of have to, the heck is going on? Poor old pheasants. <laughs> then you, <laughs> then you kind of have to go with it. You know, you have to, you have to embrace the whole S-Trig, V-Trig thing and, and, and lots of other weird quirkiness that comes with the whole Moog modular affair. So to me that meant that, that it was a difficult range of modular to get into as the casual Eurac person because you like a bit of this and you like a bit of that, you like one of those and one of those. And that was difficult to do, I think, with those Moog clones. And so I imagine Behringer have found themselves with just warehouses full of the stuff. <laughs> and so they're knocking it out super cheap. I mean, it's a heck of a way to get into modular. You can get yourself an entire uh, two rows, a two, you know, a big case worth of modular for a couple of grand, under a couple of grand now, which is uh, which is quite really quite extraordinary. But other stuff, most of which we've seen before. There's been updates to the brains. They've added in a bit of the DX7 business that uh, uh, that was added to the plats. Uh, just before Christmas, of the actual sort of new, new things that Behringer have been sort of revealing. They've got the Juno 60, or Neptune, I think they're calling it. Uh, they're going all the way on that, and they're also planning to do an OBX, um, whatever it is, Oberheim drum machine. <laughs> DMX, is it? Oh, I forget. But suffice to say that Behringer are desperate. You can feel the desperation to release a product, to actually get something to the shops. They they are besides themselves. <laughs> we must, must get something out the door, Uli, we must. So, you know, I think uh, perhaps this year is gonna be the year that we are gonna drown in Behringer product, which which should be fun, I think. Now, there's a lot of uh, interesting and crazy synths to, to play with, and that's gonna be awesome for many of us. Clevgrand have got together with Wintergatten. Wintergatten, you think, what is that about? Now, you may remember a few years ago, there's this fabulous video of this guy, this big machine with a big handle on the side and a bunch of marbles, and he went, egg -a -dick -a -dick -a -dick -a -dick. and this thing started spewing marbles all over the place, hitting twangy things and a bass guitar and some drums, and it made this marvelous sound. And it was essentially this, this big analog hand-cranked sequencer. <laughs> 
<laughs> this guy had built to play this particular song. And it's like an enormous music box somehow, but it was fantastic. I mean, what a great thing. And it thrilled us on the YouTubes. Well, they've got together with Clev Grand, who make interesting, quirky software synthesizers, effects, instruments, that kind of thing, and have come up with something called Speldolza. Speldolza, which is probably Swedish for starlight or something of that nature. And what it is, it's it's like a music box. You get the row of tines, I guess you'd call them, twangy, twangy bits, and you play it, and it's beautiful. It is simply beautiful. Beautiful sound of tingly tangly tines and you know, electric piano style vibraphone kinda sounds light marbles hitting on those things it's beautiful it's very very simple there's four different models I think or sample sets one of them is everything in reverse which is just very very sweet as it sucks stars back into itself in its interface it's nice got a big fat reverb on there um, it only costs about a tenner. It's just a beautiful little instrument. I confess I was expecting a whole lot more. I was expecting some kind of sequence, you know, some kind of marble drop sequencing something or other. So in some respects, when I first opened the email about it, I was kind of disappointed. <laughs> but that doesn't take away from the fact that it's a beautiful little synthesizer. <laughs> The Patching Panda Particles looks like a very interesting thing. Very interesting. Four sliders, it's a trigger sequencer which seems to have baked into itself a whole load of algorithmic patterns, probability and interesting randomness. It sort of has reflections of the stochastic inspiration generator where you just put sliders up and that dictates how often something is going to trigger. But this is all about triggering, although interestingly I have used the stochastic for triggering, triggering the zaps as I did during my gig, funnily enough. So it's yeah, you know, it's an idea that I'm already into. But this is a four channel one. There seems to be lots of other stuff going on that's not yet suitably explained. <laughs> There's uh, all sorts of uh, you know scaling and slopes and uh, pattern generating something or others. Uh, Jeremy at Red Means Recording has done a video on it where you have absolutely no idea what it is that it's doing within the video, but there's an extraordinary amount of music and stuff going on, which you have to attribute to this to this module in some way, but you don't really know don't really know how or why. But it's extraordinary nonetheless. But it's definitely floating my boat. I'm waiting for a kit to become available over this way because I can't seem to get a hold of one uh, in the UK. They have them in Exploding Shed, but unfortunately they don't ship to the UK. Oh because of Brexit, bloody hell. So, you know, I'm hanging out there for thonk at the moment. Hopefully they'll get some soon and I'll be able to build one because it looks like an interesting build and then have a good play because it's just the sort of thing I like. Randomization in percussion because, you know, you're probably not noticing, but this is mostly a percussion case that I'm working on at the moment. I've got a lot of percussion modules that I'm doing reviews of, things like the Wobbler 2, the Zaps, the uh, Modbap Trinity and other bits and pieces. So I'm, I'm trigger heavy, trigger happy right now. So that's the sort of thing that I'd really like to explore alongside my, my microgrids and other things I'm using for triggering. So yeah, super excited about triggery things at the moment. So that looks just right. Particles, patching panda. Um, I'd like a kit, please. Somebody tell me you've got a kit and I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll buy it off you. Nothing new here really, but this is Soma Labs getting together with Perfect Circuit and Andrew Wang in order to produce a customised Pulsar 23. Pulsar 23 is an awesome, weird, <laughs> organic, somehow flowing modulatable drum machine. It's not like any other drum machine, don't program patterns. You kind of involve yourself in the generation of loops through uh, finger interaction, control voltage and other means. It's it's like the most exciting drum machine I've never had a go on. I, I, I've tried really hard to have a go on it and th there just doesn't seem to become, it doesn't become available to me. I've seen it at a couple of shows and I've stood around near it for a while hoping for whoever it is is mucking about and it taking far too long to stop and they don't. So I have to wander off and do something else. It was even at Synth East, my own show, and I still didn't have time to go and play on it because I was too busy talking to people. <laughs> So hopefully one day I'll get a chance to play on the thing. But as I say, it's not a new thing. All Andrew has done is suggested that they paint it yellow and put some different knobs on. 
but that's great I mean it deserves a bit of attention it deserves uh, to be brought back to to the front again to say look this is an awesome drum machine and more people should be using it absolutely yeah absolutely so thanks Andrew for bigging it up and I'm quite happy to to big you up in return <laughs> Castor and Pollux is one of those juicy, juicy fat oscillators from Winterbloom. It's really interesting in that it uses two oscillators within the one package, but rather than complexiting itself into each other to create FM clangy tones, which we all so love, this actually runs the two oscillators together in a more of a sort of, sort of synced, detuned, phasing, chorusing kind of way, giving you this really fat, and juicy sound with multiple wave shapes out either together or separately or synced or not it's the sort of oscillator that's just this massive or can be this massive bass line in your system it's great looks beautiful too and i confess that i did add some extra knobs knob caps over the top because i found the knobs a little bit fiddly but hey it seems that winter balloon have been uh, sort of listening to that kind of critique and have produced the caster and pollux 2 Pox 2 has more epicness, more legendariness uh, within it. It has uh, reworked the LFO inside for its own self modulation in different sorts of uh, waveforms, I believe. It now has hard sync within itself to itself and with itself. And they've reworked the interface to actually give you some decent sized knobs, which I'm very grateful for. At the expense, though, of having to kick all the waveform outputs, all the individual waveform outputs, to a separate expander. So you've kind of got your 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 main mix waveform output directly there as well as your cv control but then if you want individual outputs on the waveforms we do because what you do you each it's got like waveform mixing so each waveform has a knob for it so you can bring its level in and out so you can reduce quite these as i say these very juicy waveforms but it's also very good at individual waveforms and so having an expander for those individual outputs i think is a great idea should probably come as as standard with it I would say but that should be coming in May apparently so looking forward to hearing that in action the face hugger <laughs> it's a great name I really like it I mean you know we do we like all of that alien kind of it doesn't really matter the face hugger from flight of harmony who do other weird stuff I mean they're they're kind of into their horror themed terrifying modules I think you would say but this is an eight channel voltage generator it's a bit like a variegate well I mean I, I think you've got sliders eight sliders each of which produces a certain amount of voltage that you can you can set up and then you can sequence it or chain it together in such a way that it becomes a sequencer it becomes an arpeggiator it becomes an envelope it becomes a modulator an LFO all sorts of other bits and pieces it's a really you know it's a it's a solid idea I think of an interesting way of putting an eight step modulator into your system that can that can act as all sorts of different functions at the moment it's a bit of a prototype and what they've decided to do wisely or unwisely is to throw it onto Kickstarter now I say unwisely because they're asking for 20 grand <laughs> which seems like a lot of money seems like a lot of money for a slightly exploratory not yet quite made module hmm. so the idea is that the money will help fund the development you know, which, which is good obviously but you know you've got to get like 150 200 people to sign up for a quite niche a niche but interesting <laughs> model in Eurac, which is a very niche business in the first place. So it just seems like a bit of an ask to me. However, I've come up with $200. I've thrown them, uh, thrown them $200 for a kit version because I think it's a, a fascinating idea. I really, I really like it. I like the name. <laughs> I like the concept. If they can put it together and make it work, I'm sure it's going to do a lot more than it says it will at the moment. If they can only get enough people interested in it, then perhaps it will become a bit of a goer. They plan to deliver by September, but if you're interested in something which is fascinating, fabulous, eight sliders, mm, envelopes, LFOs, arpeggiations, oh yes. Yes, I think so. You should get along down there and, uh, and order yourself, pledge yourself one, so that they can raise the 20 grand they need to make it happen. I mean, at the moment, they're only about, you know, uh, three or four days in and they've got six thousand pounds worth of investment which is not bad 
you know, they could do it. They could do it. It is within the realms of possibilities. I just, I just feel they should have aimed a little bit lower, perhaps. But we shall see. The noise engineering Yester Versio is the latest in their Versio collection of DSP-based URAC modules. All of them are essentially the same. They just have different front panels and a different firmware. All the firmwares are loadable onto the other one. So whichever Versio you buy, you can load up well, all of the firmwares from the whole range of Versio modules. It's quite awesome. Quite awesome, really. I've tended to find them a little bit complicated, a little bit overly complex and offering slightly, I mean, it's noise engineering, so it's always gonna be slightly weird, slightly strange, complicated, interesting, digital, those sorts of things is what noise engineering likes to do. And the Versio Rangers absolutely played to their, to their type. This time around, with the Yester, it's supposed to be a simple delay. <laughs> simple delay. I mean, how is it gonna be a simple delay? I mean, apparently it's a three tap delay, that and you've got um, control of delay time, feedback, panning on whether it's dotted or, or triplets. So it's already getting complicated. Uh, you can clock it, it can be synchronized, and then, oh look, there's a filter, oh, there's a VCA, a wave folder, and a chorus all packed in as well. Yeah, 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 simple, simple. It's what we like. I mean, honestly, I guess the Versio platform has, I mean, you've got, you know, 10 knobs on the front and 10. 10 patch points you've got to fill those up with something so regardless of how simple they think it may be they can't help themselves they've got to pad it out with stuff with useful stuff but it does sound like it's the sort of versio that i would be able to use without too much trouble so hurrah for that so maybe finally i could get into the versio lifestyle man maybe that's the way forward maybe that's the way in this is not rocket science wobbler 2 or perhaps wobbler squared wobbler to the power of two I think that might be it. Anyway, this is a great one because this is not rocket science. Were finding they needed to do a whole bunch of wobblers. Now, wobblers are their very interesting phasing dual LFO. It's a it's a good solid module that that's been around a little while and they'd ran out and they thought we'd better do some more. They went to do that and they discovered that the microcontroller that they wanted to use to make it with, like last time, were just unavailable. Just could not get them. So they thought, well, heck, let's use something else. So they did put that in, got that all working, and went, well, they've got, got like, our code is running in this little weeny corner of this new microprocessor, and we've got all this yawning space. Why don't we do something with that? So they did. So Wobbler Squared has an entire drum synthesizer packed into it. That's not the sort of thing you'd usually associate with an LFO, but hey, what the heck? This is not rocket science. This is this is not rocket science. And they do whatever they like. They don't they don't follow anybody else's rules. They just get stuck in there with whatever floats their boat. And this time around it was a drum synth. Now I'm working on this at the moment and it's a lot of fun, I have to say. So the LFO side, yeah, phasing, interesting uh, LFOs. It's got a twang in it as well, as well as a pendulum, which, ba which is based on physical modeling. And it's that coding that sort of brought them towards the idea of doing some sort of physical modeling drums as well. You know, the, the code already has it in, so they could utilize it um, in order to expand the possibilities of the module. So that's what they did. So the LFO side is great. I'm not gonna spend any more time talking about that. It's the drum synth side, which is the interesting bit. So what you get is, I think, seven drum sounds based on wobbly um, physical modeling things. <laughs> seven sounds around a dial, each of which has two controls in which to modulate it with, which produces different timbres and different ideas and different lengths and those sorts of those sorts of things a couple of things to fiddle with that would normally be fiddling with the lfo this is now fiddling with the nature of the, the modeling with inside the module and it's great i mean to 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 really get across what it does is you plug in a bunch of triggers a pattern from somewhere you know it could just be a, a clock you could plug a, pl a clock in as the trigger and then for each trigger, you can start manipulating and have a different sound on every one. So it's, so it's a linear drum machine, essentially. So you put your trigger pattern in, 
you know, just one channel of trigger, trigger patterns and you have it change all the time and you get this wonderful percussive line out. I mean, it's a little bit like the Basimilus uh, Arturitus Ultra, I suppose, like a, a digital module that you modulate a lot as you trigger it. It's a little bit like Zaps, which I'll talk about more at a, a later date. It's a little bit like the DFAM as a sound source, which I've never really understood, never understood the, the DFAM. I try it. I, 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 you know, I try it and play with it. But now I think I can probably go back and work it better because I've grasped now the nature of a linear drum sound source that you can modulate and change the sound of because you just end up with these really interesting evolving and randomized percussion lines, which are just, just fantastic. And that is absolutely what the Wobbler Squared is. It's fantastic. But not only that, it also has hidden away in it a bunch of sample drum kits, which is a massive surprise. <laughs> so, you know, happily playing along with the synthesized stuff. Yeah, this is great. I'm really enjoying that. But with a shift tap, you suddenly got like a rock kit, some 80s snares, a, a chiptune um, arcade kit, and you've got some vocal wobbly kits and other bits and pieces as well. Fantastic, I suppose. But again, you have to be able to hit those notes individually because within the kit, you've got seven sounds that you are triggering. You have to be able to modulate between them. And that, that was a little bit more tricky. That's quite tricky to, to get exactly right. You've got to do a little bit of thinking on that. But I will explain and expand upon this completely and fully in a video review, which is coming very soon. The Lupe from MIDIFY has a new firmware update which builds in a long-awaited song mode. Now the Lupe, if you've never seen it, is a, it's quite a, a, a nice looking, a nuanced box of um, MIDI looping and sequencing, or requantizing as, as, they, as they like to call it. It's very fast, very quick, uh, very meaty desktop MIDI sequencing, and is based around this, this lovely interface of a clacky mechanical keyboard, but one that has LEDs that can shine through it. You may be more familiar with a big matrix frame thing that they have that you can do proper matrix sequencing on it. Well, not unlike the Relic, I suppose, but in a bit more of a mechanical, it feels like it's a, a more meaty, hands-on mechanical thing that you would hold with a couple of hands and tap in those sorts of notes. But the Lupe is a fully featured six channel MIDI sequencer with everything available at your fingertips and a gorgeous OLED screen in order to make everything happen. So if you've not seen it before, do go and check it out. Chompy Club, let's all join the Chompy Club. You can imagine there's probably a theme tune to this. What the heck is this? Well, it's the it's a synthesizer made by Twilight Sparkle. I imagine <laughs> there's something out of uh, My Little Pony, Fisher Price. Those sorts of those sorts of ideas come to mind. It's an adorable, cute, wonderful briefcase of a little keyboard with sampling and looping and sound on sound stuff built directly in. What could be better than that? Well, something which is a little bit cheaper than the $600 I think they're asking for it. Good Lord, how much? <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Um, so this is this wonderful looking keyboard. I mean, I, I love it. I love the idea. I love the intention, the fact that you're trying to take something which is often more than likely complicated. If you consider something like the Roland SP404 or the Sonicware um, sample track, that's the fella. If you look at things like that, they've got horrible user interfaces where everything is just difficult, but you fight on through and eventually you become a master of sampling and looping, which is awesome. But with this, you just hit the smiley face, hit the smiley face, and it starts sampling, hit the other smiley face, and it loops. It's brilliant. It throws it across the keyboard, does all the things that you expect you would probably do anyway, which is always the flaw with these sample track type things. They assume that you're going to do something really interesting, and you're not. You're going to do the same thing every time. You're going to sample something, you want it across the keyboard. That's it. Why, should, why do you need to go through steps and menus in order to achieve that? That's just... Anyway. Join the Chompy Club and you could just do it. It's just there. Off you go. So it looks like a lot of fun. It's got a clackety clickety keyboard on the front, a couple of knobs, smiley faces. It's the sort of thing that definitely invites exploration, I would say, or exploration by your kids. I mean, why not? I mean, you know, why buy them a PlayStation when you can get them a, uh, a Chompy Club? That's what I say. <laughs> awesome. 
the Logue CL1 is another one of those magic MIDI controllers. It's a MIDI controller that will do everything for you, as all MIDI controllers tend to promise to be, and tend to do, and always end up just being the, the same, really. It's a MIDI controller, you've got a knob, you've got to map it, and then off you go. But no, apparently this is going to do that all for you, or something. Automatic mapping with Ableton Live. So honestly, I think we've heard it all before, many, many, many times. But how is this one different? Well, this one looks rather lovely and has individual displays for every single knob. Pretty sure I've spoken about this before. Pretty sure we saw it a couple of years ago, but maybe this is it actually coming into fruition. So it has this lovely silver panel with 28 knobs and 28 displays. The display sucks information out of Ableton Live and sticks it up on the knobs. You don't have to look at the screen as you're controlling things. You can see it on the, on the device. So the hardware becomes the hardware interface for the software. I think that's the idea. But it becomes it to a point where you can actually see on the hardware what it is, because that's always been the flaw. Having a blank controller is fine, but you need to look at the screen as you move the knobs which is okay, you know, we're happy with that to some degree, but when once you actually have a piece of real hardware that has labels on it, and the one knob actually controls the thing that it's labeled for, that elevates it to a whole different hardware experience. And because it's got these little screens, which you can change, it can absolutely show you on the device what it is you're controlling without you having to look at the screen, without you having to pick up your mouse. And that's interesting, I think, that's, that could be unique, and golly, does that sound expensive. <laughs> well, apparently the price is going to be about 600 euros, and they are looking, allegedly, to raise about 150,000 on Kickstarter. Hmm. <laughs> that seems a lot. I mean, you know, I mean, it's a mini controller, so there's a far larger market for it than it was for the Eurorack and the 20 grand I was talking about earlier. But still, 150. Woo, that's that's a lot, and it's six hundred pounds for a MIDI controller. See, that's that synthesizer money, isn't it? Yeah, you want a controller to be a couple of hundred quid, don't you? So tricky. I, I feel. I mean, I love the concept, love the idea, love what they're doing. I just feel that um, I'm not sure that there's really the market for it. I mean, what do you think? Let us know in the comments. Out of Japan comes the Cosmos Quencher. Interesting. It's a Eurac module with a big flower on the front that aims to be a phrase generator. So there seems to be a lot of manipulation about. There seems to be these eight petals, I think it is, that are involved in the production of phrases that you can then pump into your, uh, your oscillators to create interesting melodies and tunes from. It's bound to be scaling involved. There's bound to be some kind of quantizable sequence which you can then manipulate through randomization, through modulation, until you ultimately get some kind of interesting output. It seems to have an oscillator inside as well, so it can generate its own sounds as well as controlling other things. And we're talking about CV and we're talking about gate patterns too. So it sort of could be the idea of building together a sequencer with a Euclidean pattern generator in order to have something that, that kind of generates its own tunes. Very interesting. I don't think we've really gotten to the bottom of what this is about, but you know, one to watch. From that most reliable of software instrument emulators, Cherry Audio, we get a go on the Jupiter 6. They're calling it the Mercury 6, which is kind of a nice name, although it sounds like the name for something else for some reason. I'm not quite quite sure what that was. But apparently the Jupiter 6 is the unloved or underappreciated synthesizer that appeared between the Jupiter 4 and the Jupiter 8. But according to the blurb on the website, is just always been the best one, is the one only one that we should ever should have cared about, really. And here they are with their own Jupiter 6 emulation that you should take note of. And the Mercury 6 totally captures it in all, all its glorious analog glory. Apparently its main uh, special features were that it had a multi-mode filter and that you, and you had multiple simultaneous waveforms. And on the downside, it was mono, which 
I don't think anybody really cares about these days. It only had six voices of polyphony. But heck, the Mercury 6 is going to be in software. So it's going to have a gazillion outputs and a gazillion notes of polyphony. So we're not to worry about those sorts of things. The important thing is that Cherry Audio has captured that sound, has captured that interface, and is delivering it to you for probably $30. And while we're talking about emulations, let's talk about the Mini Monster 2 from GeForce. I mean, if Cherry Audio are... Uh, the best at software emulation instruments at the moment, then GeForce have been doing it for longer and arguably have the edge on actual sound quality. They just don't seem to have the prolificness of Cherry Audio. Cherry Audio seem to be able to grab and do everything, just phew, pumping them out like nobody's business. GeForce likes to take a good 10 years over putting together an emulated synthesizer and the Mini Monster is one of those. I mean, they've had it for a long time. It's their Mini Moog, I suppose, but this version two just seems to blow it apart. So its top new feature is, of course, it has a fully scalable UI. It's very exciting. <laughs> so rather than having the tiny Mini Monster on your screen, you can now enlarge it to any size. And then you've got a browser. These are all kind of, I don't know, these are the most irrelevant updates. <laughs> but why is it? Why is it the top new feature? That's why I don't know. Top new feature, you can resize it. Oh, God, great, really? I don't even look at the interface when I'm playing it, for heaven's sake. Oh, look, it's a browser. Really? I can categorize my sounds? Well, that's awesome. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude about it, but let's try to find something that's actually, what's, what's good? New features, come on. Programmable macros. Okay, so you can, you've got a knob which you can assign to, to control different things at once. That's interesting. Always like that sort of thing. It makes for a very powerful way to modulate your, your synthesizer sound. It's got a four-stage envelope and an alternative filter. Oh, an alternative to the ladder filter. That's sacrilege, surely. No, no, no. Can we really be doing that? <laughs> Apparently it's a bit bass-preserving. Does that mean the other one didn't was bass-destroying filter? And they've put in a reverb and a bit of extra playability with performance um, controls, aftertouch, that kind of thing. And it's got a vintage knob for adding in those vintage imperfections to make it sound more vintage. So, I don't know, I'm being a little bit facetious. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where that came from because it's beautiful. I mean, you can't get a better Mini Moog emulation than uh, the Mini Monster. And version 2, really, what it, they've done is they've reached back into the past. Uh, this poor, tired old emulation of theirs, um, which has been you know a bit dog-eared and not really working right on modern compu computers, I imagine. And they've brought it back up to date. They've made the interface work properly, put in a browser so people can find the heck their sounds are, added a vintage knob to make it sound more crappy, and just beefed it up in other places. Great job. This is a little bit space age. It has a it has the vibe of the push to and a deluge about it, I would say. Maybe a little bit of polyend as well. It mixes these things together. I mean it's a massive 16 by 16 matrix of light up buttons. With this really interesting strip screen above it, and then a whole shed load of buttons and and knobs. It has everything. Well, everything everywhere. It does everything. The idea is that the relic is a matrix sequencer. It's a regular sequencer, a polyphonic synth sequencer. It has uh, is a matrix mixer. It also has modulation. You can you use this sort of 16 by 16 matrix as a scribble pad for anything you like. You can draw in waveforms. You can draw in modulations envelopes you can then light it up like a Yamaha Tenori and do I mean I've always I always like those sorts of grid sequences I think they're fantastic just so easy yeah you know, once you've got it set to some kind of scale just to pump in a bunch of notes and it could be a beautifully tinkly thing I mean combine it up with the the Clevgard uh, Spelloza Spe Spelagoza, Spel the shiny t shiny tinkly thing <laughs> what and it could be awesome in fact it probably is awesome now this looks very expensive. It looks very, very nice in what is probably a render of this uh, wooden uh, sided cabinet box for it. The screen, which is going to change and show everything, and show your routing and show uh, your modulations, everything you're doing does look very interesting. Beautiful, in fact, beautifully animated, beautifully colored. You know, it, it's almost too extraordinary. It's like a fever dream of control. <laughs> You know, what if we packed everything into the one box? Yeah, 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 that, that'll, that'll do it. And then on the back, you've got a couple of MIDI outs, sure, but hey, why don't we 
add a complete patch bay that works as a URAC module you can drop into your system so we can patch it directly to that and then that spills out 16 channels of CV in and out and gates and, and such like so you can really run your whole system from it. Wow. I mean this is pretty epic really <laughs> and it will do MIDI and it will do CV um, with this beautiful screen that's showing you what to do you can mix with it I mean it's a launch pad you know I mean you've got your circuit launch pad which is 8 by 8 you've got these this very low resolution sort of usage of it to show you digits and mixing and panning oh there are eight channels and I can just about do four levels of mixing on it this just ups that massively to 16 by 16 it gives you such a high resolution of stuff that it really could act as a mixer panner sends sequencer envelope generator LFO modulator router and so on it really could but apparently it's going to be launching soon for about 1700 euros hmm. I don't know if you've noticed but I tend to moan about envelopes a lot. I struggle with envelopes, never quite sure what to do with them. Well I know what to do with them, they just never seem to do exactly what I think they should half the time and I get all muddled up between me sustains and me releases and me decays and what's that about and is it triggered or is it gated or is it you know I just oh, envelopes they just do my head in. Anyway, Expert Sleeper has obviously heard me moaning and said I know what we'll do, we'll, we'll introduce an envelope which will sort him out. We'll sort that poor little bugger out and he'll be able to happily use envelopes for the rest of his life without having to worry about it anymore. And, and so that's what they did. And, and it's called Amelia, which is rather nice. So this is an envelope just for me. I'm looking around because I thought I had it here. Yeah, I do. Look, here it is because I bought one. And is it, is the question, is this the answer to enveloping? Yes, yes, I, I rather think that it is. It's totally brilliant why is it brilliant it's because it has a break in it a break rather than sustain so the break is the point at which it then is the point at which the release happens i think so you've got attack and decay i can understand attack and decay rise and fall things like that that i find i tend to find really easy so you put the attack at nothing and you have the decay fall away after that great that's all i really really want particularly and that's what this gives but it puts this break point in that decay so you can hit that point and that's when it starts to release and what that means in reality is that when you're using it with a filter it's just works it just is working it all the time and you can adjust the break point and that that changes the way that that filter is opening and closing a little bit just enough to give you a variation in sound and then you can choose to add boom, release onto that afterwards to make it sort of fade away nicely depending on what you're doing I mean, Oz Expert Sleeper says that this is designed primarily for sequencing, for stuff that's going to be a little bit faster rather than long evolving things. And that's exactly what I want. That's what I want it for. That's what I want envelopes to do. Uh, simple, straightforward. <laughs> you know, I don't want all the, don't need all this ADSR business necessarily. You know, this is just changed enough to make it fast. Uh, responsive to really tickle that filter in the ways that you expect to hear it and how you would expect to find it in a hardware synthesizer and that's been a struggle of mine in trying to find uh, a filter envelope combination that works in in a simple enough way just to be able to dial it in and off you go this is it very very pleased with this uh, it's only over here on a pile because uh, like I said, I'm working currently on percussion over here. So I don't need it just at the moment, but I'll be certainly bringing that back in to run my bass lines for everything in the future. Just a quick warning from IntelliGel. They are poised to release a couple of modules. I got a wind of them <laughs> this morning. Uh, one of them is called Flurry. I believe it's a collection of utilities within a module. Uh, sort of all packed in there. Things like a, a modulator, clock, noise source other bits and pieces flurry it's a really great name for a module i think the other one's called amp or amps which i think is a two channel vca on sliders which just looks quite nice so i thought i'd tell you about that and i thought i'd also mention that shack Mac have also just dropped a couple of modules just as i was starting to film this which i can't remember what they're called unfortunately <laughs> yes i can no i do know they're called banshee reach <laughs> which is a VCO, uh, an analog VCO with wave shaping. 
which is interesting. It reminds me of the Pony VCO from uh, Bafaco. I think there's a lot of wave shaping. It seems to be the thing. It's what's trendy at the moment. It's to dig wave shaping into your oscillator. So that's looking pretty tidy. The other one is called Jeweler Cast and appears to be a wave folding, wave shaping kind of uh, thing all by itself as well. So those are new modules from Shackmat. Like I say, I don't have all the details yet, but do go and check those out because they do look interesting. Korg keep managing to do interesting things. They have apparently released the NTS2 now. That's the little oscilloscope in a box. They did sort of promise to send me one, but I haven't seen it yet. But I might get one soon, which would be, which would be nice to go along with the patch and tweak Korg book which could be great. But apparently my Korg insiders tell me that there's plenty more goodies to come. Uh, one thing they come up with this month is the, is the sort of DIY synthesizer kit thing for the ARP Odyssey. ARP Odyssey, gorgeous little synthesizer. These, I don't know about these snap together kits, <laughs> you know, I think if it's a kit, it should, be, it should be a kit. It should involve soldering, I think. It should involve a little bit of danger, the possibility that you're either going to suffocate in the smell of, uh, of resin or you're going to hurt yourself somehow. But that's not what we've got. What we've got is a, a kit version of the ARP Odyssey where you kind of snap it together. It's a limited edition, cost an absolute fortune <laughs> for reasons that I can't really explain. But... But there you go, if, you, if you're scared of soldering, you don't really want to do any DIY, you just like the idea of having a, a synth which is just a slightly bit cheaper than getting the one fully built, then that's for you, if they've got any left. Because as I say, there's only a limited run of them, so they've probably gone already. But, but good fun, is it a trend that I'd like to see continue? What if it makes synths slightly cheaper and it gives people a sense that they might have something to do with the build of their synthesizer? Then that's no bad thing, but don't tell me it's a kit, man. It's not a kit. It's not DIY. Not truly. It's a snap together. It's a Lego version. It's not Airfix. No. Let's, let's not get ourselves confused. And this just in. Uh, Waves. Waves plugins that have decided to go all in on the subscription module. All of it. The whole lot. All at once. No options. No alternatives. No upgrades to anyone except for if you're signed up to the subscription service. What does the world think of that? Well, interesting, I just went to the website and it's, oh. <laughs> I, I think perhaps again, inundated with people going, no, no, I don't think so, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, I don't know, the old, old, old discussion about subscription, is it good, is it bad, is it helpful, does it help people, does it not? Paying for constant upgrades and maintenance or should you be able to buy something once and use it forever? I mean, that's a, a novel concept in of itself. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I used to have a Waves dongle many, many years ago. Some strange, it was called something odd and strange. It was different. It was a parallel port one. You had to do all sorts of shenanigans on Windows to get that to work. So at least those days are behind us. Although, you know, there were some good things about dongles. They enabled you to run your plugins wherever you liked, provided you connect the thing that you'd, that you'd purchased. A bit like an iLock, hmm, an early iLock. But who knows what sort of thing you're going to have to use now in order to prove that you've got the plugins that you were using. And of course, if you if you use one plugin on a project somewhere and then decide, oh, I don't want to subscribe to this anymore, you're not going to be able to go back to that project and load it up. That's going to be the problem because that plugin won't work. This is the thing. This is the thing we... I don't know, it works. I mean, for instance, I subscribe to Adobe Photoshop. You know, it costs me eight pounds or something a, a month. I can't remember exactly. And that seems fine because I could never come up with the hundreds and hundreds of pounds required to buy the software. But I've been quite happy paying probably that much and more over time because it's a small amount. And that and that's and it's something that I use absolutely every day. The the problem I always see with plugins and musical gear generally is that unless you are a professional in which case you know who knows it doesn't matter you don't tend to use it all the time you may use it on one project and then six months later you'll use it again and you end up with having to to maintain a subscription and a payment for something that you'll use once in a blue moon and that seems a shame whereas you know 30 quid on a plug-in that i'll use once in a while fantastic i can i can cope with that you know but I'm trying to get more information on it 
Oh, it's back. It's back. It's called uh, Waves Creative Access. There you go. You can start from free. <laughs> Not sure how that works. But it's total freedom from the world's largest catalogue of industry leading plugins and a powerful AI mixing tools. So you say to Jack GPT, mix all my tracks, please. And, and off it goes, which is which is great. So there's 220 plugins, future updates, new plugins added regularly. It's a whole studio verse for one handy subscription. What could possibly be wrong with that? I don't know, but, but lots of people are talking about it. And I would just say that the places where it's worked well, I think, are places where they offer a subscription, which is fine for some people, but they also give you the opportunity just to buy stuff flat out. And I think that's important. It gives it gives people an option because subscription doesn't work for everybody. And there's nothing worse than thinking of, you know, if I if I stop this subscription, then all my software will stop working. That's a horrible, horrible state of affairs to be in. So having the option to purchase something a lifetime license for I think is always a really really good thing but it appears that waves have gone that we're just going to go straight subscription so we'll see what happens with that we'll see there might be so much of a backlash that they just can't can't continue with it I don't know in one easy subscription but that that is or has been the way things are going a lot particularly with plugins particularly with instruments which is why something like Cherry Audio I spoke about a little while ago, you know, 30 quid for one of their synthesizers. Fantastic. You know, buy it, use it, don't use it. Brilliant. You don't want a subscription. You don't want to have to you don't want to have to go through the stress of having to update it every year. But heck, on the flip side, pay one fee, get everything. There is something in that, you know. And it's far more cost effective than buying them all individually. Not that you would ever, ever use all of them individually. You'd use one or two compressors, one or two this, that and the other, an occasional plugin. Hey, what do I know? I can't possibly comment on what you would use and how you would use it. But there you go, that's the news. Waves have gone, subscription only. Have fun. And finally, you may be aware that I've worked for many years as a writer on the website gearnews.com and I continue to do so and it's a, it's a happy, happy place. However, Gear News has kind of pivoted more towards um, magazine articles more recently and that's meant that I've not been able to write as many of the, of the, the news about the little bits and pieces that I really enjoy so much bringing to you in my Molten Monthlies. So I've sort of made a decision to start to start releasing my own news articles on my own website. All the bits and pieces that I think are perhaps being missed or not being looked at or things I would just like to share my opinion on. Partly this is to build my own enormous media empire and some of it is because when I sit down to write uh, Molten Music Monthlies as I have the past few months I've been sitting down going I don't actually know what any of the news is because I'm no longer really covering all of the stuff that I'd like to talk about. And so it seems right to me that as I have to research this video anyway, I might as well be writing it up and sending it out to you good people. So if you like to hear what it is that I've got to say about various news things, it will always be laden and dripping full of my opinion, then go and visit the website, Molten Music Technology, the main website, that's where it is. I'm just posting stuff up there, hopefully on a daily basis, that should be a good source of interesting news, interesting thought about new products and stuff that's coming along and anything that tickles my fancy, really. You'll also find on there reviews of all the stuff that I've done, uh, links to all the videos that I've done. I'm also, I have been and I'm going to retry developing written versions of the reviews and the Molten Monthly that I do so that you can sit there and read it rather than having to watch it, if that makes sense. <laughs> And so hopefully there's room out there for yet another source of, of news and interesting opinion on stuff. And I'll, I'm going to keep that flowing, provided that it's interesting to people and, and hopefully it will be helpful. And so that also means that if you're a manufacturer out there who has news, let me know. Even better, if you have a leak, you want to leak something before it's news, then I'll have that. <laughs> that would be great. So that'll do, I think, for now. I've got a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Coming along, a lot of videos to make at the moment, a lot of DIY, a bit of Deckard's Dream just to finish that off, got to do that, but 
uh, proper full-on reviews. I've got coming up uh, the Wobbler 2 doing that, and Modpap Trinity, the Plankton Zaps, all of those are, are scheduled for uh, proper in-depth video video type reviews. And then following on from that, I've got the Maelstrom Mandrake, which I've got doing an awesome kick drum in my system here at the moment. I've got the Schleppy Engineering Three Bodies, which I haven't, I haven't quite unwrapped yet. <laughs> which just scares the life out of me. What am I going to do with three oscillators in a thing? Complex? What? And then of course I've got the Oxy Instruments Coral, which I'm also working on at the moment at the same time as the Wobbler. It's like when I fiddle with one and then I go fiddle with the other. It's really interesting. It's going to take a little bit of time, I think, because there's there's complexities involved and a depth to a multi-synthesizer engine module that I, I need to spend time with, really, before I can make a video on it. Similarly, I've still got the Chord Pilot from Nobula to, to work on, which will go well with the Coral, I think. So I need to wrap my head around that as well. <sighs> got a lot of stuff. I mean, I'd like to do something on the Amelia, which is sitting there. Does it need its own video? Well, I mean, that's, that's one of those questions, isn't it? And I've still got the 2500 over there to do. <laughs> Wherever I look, I can see a thing that I need to talk about. It'd be really great to do a video on. I'm very excited about doing videos. I, I, you know, I, I love the thing. And I've still got some brilliant ideas I want to share with you very soon, which are more just so exciting. And yes, I mean, that I do have other modules on the uh, bubbling along on the go of, of my own thought and design, which is going to be very exciting. Got some an, a new something or other coming from Bufaco very soon as well. There's just no end to it. It's just terribly exciting. Terribly exciting. So please, if you'd like to support my channel, do consider signing up on Patreon, where you get special, special access to me and everything that's wonderful about it and that. Otherwise, pop over to the website. Check out the news, man. Follow along on that. Join us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, those sorts of places, and I'll keep you updated on, on what the heck is going on in my usual, fabulously jovial, humorous, and opinionated... Uh, fashion. Well, so I hope that was all useful and helpful, and in the meantime, go make some tunes. Mm -hmm.